Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the DROPS Asia Steering Committee, uh, welcome to this webinar on dropped object prevention uh, on land rig operations. My name is Joachim van der Meule, and I'm the secretary for DROPS Asia. I'll be your host for the next 90 minutes. Uh, so we're logged into Zoom webinar, which is slightly different uh, to a regular Zoom meeting. Uh, you won't be able to share your uh, video or audio or screen, uh, but instead we welcome you to um, uh, introduce yourself via the chat uh, function. So there's a button on uh, at the bottom which says chat. chat. If you click there, um, you can introduce yourself. Now there's a little drop down menu um, there. If you click there, you can set either to send a message to the host and panelists or to everyone. Now, if you want to introduce yourself to everyone, then make sure you tick that everyone uh, button. Uh, please introduce yourself. Even you may introduce your company, um, but please only do that once. So towards the end of this uh, event, we will be transitioning to our Drops Forum app, where you'll be able to meet and network with other participants. Um, I'll explain this in a little bit more detail uh, later. Um, and um, I would like to remind everyone that this webinar is recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel. And we may also use parts uh, in our so social media channels. Uh, so we have really a good uh, turnout. I think 160 people already and, and the number is still uh, rapidly increasing. Uh, we also have a great uh, interest from new audience on, on top of uh, our existing audience, so like companies like ONGC, uh, Adnoc, um, and Saudi Aramco, uh, a warm welcome if this is your first time. And of course, a warm welcome to everyone else as well. So for today's session, we have a very experienced professional, Candy Adams, uh, who is the Quality Health, Safety, Security, Environment and Training Manager for KCA Deutech Land uh, Drilling Operations. Um, obviously, we have a lot of uh, land tricks also in Asia, um, and uh, Kenny is in Dubai, but, but frankly, you know, KCA Deutech has been so much involved with the drops chapter that you know, for us, when we think of this, um, yeah, he's kind of the person I, I think of, but I'm, I know that there's many other people who are also very experienced with this, but um, this case, we invite uh, uh, Kenny. So um, we also have Alan Smith, who is our DROPS global uh, trainer uh, and facilitator, and he may be answering a lot of questions generic to DROPS, which you may have. Um, we have William Lai, who is the uh, QHZ manager for Baker Hughes, um, uh, in Asia, and he will be facilitating uh, the Q&A uh, session uh, after. Before I invite him to introduce how that works, um, I would like to give a quick thanks to our sponsors uh, here, Stop Drop Tolling, uh, Drop Safe, and, and Access Group. Um, so yeah, William, if you could please explain how the Q&A session works uh, and then hand it over to, to Kenny. Thank you, Joachim. Thank you very much. And a big warm welcome to all the people who called in today and joined us. And, uh, and uh, it is great that uh, we have so many people on the call here today. Well, so, so after Kenny's presentation, uh, we're going to have a Q&A for sure. And what you can do and is go to the little icon below and it says Q&A. That is where you're supposed to type in your questions. So if you have any questions, that you would like to ask um, Kenny or Alan, feel free to type in a question there and then I'll pick it up and uh, I'll make sure that uh, I'll get uh, the panelists to, to help you um, to maybe share some likes to their questions. Um, and that basically it, very easy, just uh, on the Q&A part, okay? Well, uh, if there's uh, no more to do, I'll just pass the session where uh, do our great Mr. Kenny Adams. Kenny, over to you. <laughs> okay, thanks, William, and uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see a, a worldwide audience. Um, and as I said, good morning. Hope everybody's staying safe, um, staying happy and healthy. Um, I'm going to go through a presentation um, we developed just to give you an overview of what we do within KCA Doitag within the land division. Um, we've got just over 70 land rigs and we've got just over 50 operating at the moment. Um, so if you're from the land division, you understand, you know, the concepts of, you know, how land works, but this applies to offshore as well. So just to give you some overviews of some of the success stories we've had, 
some of the initiatives we recently introduced and introduced over the years. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have um, on completion of the presentation. So I'll now go to the presentation, if you just give me a minute. Yes, as I said, welcome. I'll just go some, I'm sure some of the drops we've mentioned, initiatives we've introduced within KCA Doitag. I think we're all aware throughout our industry, over 60% of high potential incidents are dropped object related and dropped objects continue to account for many fatal and potentially fatal incidents in the upstream oil and gas industry. And within our organisation, um, we focus on managing drops and lifting as an integral part of HSE systems. And we are, as you can see from the graph below, and see marked improvements through our rig operations. So the DOIR is dropped object incident uh, rate, and lifting is lifting operations incident rate. And as you can see, the graphs there, the trend's still on the decline. We're not perfect by any means, and we've still got a lot of work to do. But we've focused on this immensely, you know, Driving is probably our highest risk, driving is more dangerous than drilling, and then drops and lifting come in below there. So it's a hazard we all need to manage on a daily basis. Uh, and you can see from the chart there, you know, we are having some good successes, especially in the dropped object lifting, cranes, forklifts, etc. Obviously, on a daily basis, they're in operation, so a slightly higher incident rate there. But uh, we're on a downward trend, and uh, things are continually to, uh, improving. So what have we done to improve? Well, we do have our standards, we do have our procedures, we have many things in place, and documents don't protect us though. The document is only as good as the individual, and how do we educate and improve and sustain our performance? And when I'm looking at you know, improving our performance as a business unit, especially in HSE and security, et cetera, is I have to think of the individuals on the rig sites. Um, it, they could be Russian, they could be Arabic speakers, they could be English speakers, different educational levels, etc. So we always have to take that into consideration. So any of the media you see here, it's all translated. It's all translated into English, Arabic, Russian and German. Um, because the end user needs to understand the controls we want in place. And rather than just a nod of the head, which is acknowledgement, we need engagement. We need people to do things differently. So some of the things we've done, and I'll go through this uh, shortly, is we've introduced Interact Drop to Drops Awareness training media. Being interactive makes a huge difference. You can't just play the button, switch it off. I've learned something, that doesn't work. Uh, we've introduced uh, Drops Inspection app. We use tablet technology on the rig sites now with good success. Uh, an area I'm very happy with now and an area we continually focus on is regional management, so I'll cover that. I'll also cover lead lifting person training, similar to CLP, competent lifting person training, but an in-house training course in line with industry best practice. We'll look at the lifting operations competency book. We, are, we do have IDC approval for a competency system for all job positions. We were the first land contractor to get that a number of years ago. And to continually improve, we've developed the lifting operations competency book, which we will, we're going to seek a IDC approval for as well. And the news initiative we've recently issued is the four C's for supervisors. And I'll let you think about that and I'll come to it uh, when we go to that slide, you know, think about what, what four C's could the supervisors use on a daily basis. So these are the areas I'm going to focus slide by slide. I'm conscious of the time. So, you know, I'll cover it in, you know, in summary. And if you have any questions, you know, please put them on the chat bar and I'm sure at a later date we can follow up. So the first thing we've done is interactive training media. It was developed by the business unit team and Rouser is a company we use regularly to help us develop our media. But the importance of getting the buy-in from the team, it would be easy for me to sit behind my desk, come up with a good idea and say, right, here's the next initiative, this is what we'll do. So you work with the HIC team, we looked at stats and trends to identify you know, what areas do we need to focus on when we're talking about drops and lifting. Uh, we use animation and interaction for the viewers, and we also introduce pause points to engage the team and discuss key focus areas. And when you think of the current times that we're in at the moment, I can't get trainers out to the rigs. We're all generally locked down in our respective countries. And the best way to do it is when we issue any interactive training media, there's a script for the presenter, which may be the tool pusher, night tool pusher, could be the driller, HSE, um, whoever's chosen to present at the crew safety meeting. So 
he reads this first, identifies what he needs to do, and then you just press play. And then throughout the media, there's pause points to allow for discussion with attendees. They record it on the flip chart, on the wall, wherever they can, but it's to engage the team. And it also focuses on previous incidents and accidents. So we're learning from, uh, our, you know, basically we're a continuous learning organisation. It's in line with Drops Best Practice. Um, so that's who we go to, Silver Dot and Drops. You know, we have a look at that and say, right, yeah, this is in line with uh, industry best practice. It covers the difference between static and dynamic dropped objects. And that's an area the crews are a lot more familiar with rather than a dropped object. They know the difference between both now. We go through drops prevention and management, and the media also goes through red zone management, which is a, one of the key areas we've had great success in. And I've got another slide I'll come to that will show red zone management. So what I've got is a short introductory video just to give you a snapshot of um, the media. It's only two, three minutes long, but it gives you an idea of interactive media that we've introduced successfully in, in numerous areas. So if you let me play this. Hello and welcome to this drops training video. So, how big is the problem? Well, the UK HSE categorised dropped objects, referred to as struck by incidents, as the third highest causes of injuries and fatalities across industry. In the USA, 50,000 struck by falling object incidents are recorded by OSHA every year. That's one injury caused by a dropped object every 10 minutes. Closer to our industry, the Drops Online Forum has no shortage of case studies showing real incidents, as seen here. In fact, throughout our industry, over 60% or more of all high potential incidents are dropped object related, and they continue to account for many fatal and potentially fatal incidents in our industry. Statistics show that around 30% of all dropped object incidents are related to design, technical or mechanical issues, but almost half can be attributed to human factors. As a group, see if you can list potential causes of a dropped object. A hazard, hazard identification, is a technique for the early identification of potential hazards and threats affecting people, the environment, assets or reputation. Once we've identified the hazards with the hazard, the drops calculator, shown here, is a simple yet effective tool to help us quantify the risk. Let's use the drops calculator for a scenario. Let's assume that an item of 4 kilograms is dropped from 10 meters. Here you can see that, by using the calculator, that this has the potential to cause a fatality. One method to help identify the size of the drop zone is the cone of exposure, as seen here. The cone usually gets bigger the higher the load. Winds, slopes, load weight, and load center of gravity will affect the shape of the cone. Signs and barriers are a simple yet effective procedural control. Signs and barriers are used in conjunction with zone management procedures. When we're setting up signs and barriers, it's important that we consider the bounce for dropped objects. The cone of exposure can also support us with this. Okay, so that was just a very small snapshot of the interactive media that we um, produce on our, a regular basis in different subjects. And the idea of the interactive media, as I said earlier, is to engage the teams. Um, it's so easy, e-learning or videos, just to press and play. And do the individuals really walk away with any knowledge and understanding that we can confirm? Uh, so using the interactive media, and you have to be conscious, as I said, of time. So generally media maximum of 20 minutes with pause points 
an hour at a cruise safety meeting, the crews have a lot of good discussions. Uh, and then to follow up, we have obviously attendance and we look for feedback as well, so we can identify how we continually improve. But as I said, that's just one area that we work on uh, develop with the teams. The feedback from the teams has been great. And again, it contributes to uh, our focus to zero and managing our drops and um, lifting uh, potential incidents within the work site. We've also recently introduced uh, tablet technology on the rig sites. Uh, if you look at the third photograph in, small tablets, um, they're X-proof as well. And um, so you can use them in you know, explosive areas. Um, they're very safe, very much a tough pad. And every rigger facility has an inventory of potential dropped objects from structurally attached items and items attached to the equipment, worksite elevated area inspection manual, basically. So we've always had the manuals in place and we've also had the picture books in place. So a picture book is the second slide in from the left. So when individuals looking at certain parts within the derrick, you know, for a jobs inspection, you can identify what it's supposed to look like. And um, if there's any secondary attention, uh, retention there, and we've then now converted that rather than a picture book onto the tablet. Uh, the inventories contains details of every potential dropped object on or within elevated areas of the worksite. And each item that is listed on the invent space should and does have a photograph taken and recorded in the inventory. The photographs will also be used for the drops inspection check sheets, uh, which we use for periodical inspection. So we check each zone or area, you know, at least once a week. The new drops app, it removes the paperwork and ensures the details are available. We can put it in the action tracker, which is electronic as well. And the positive bit for me is it allows me to remotely review and verify things are getting done. So from my desktop uh, within the office or if I'm working from home, I can access the system, go in and have a look and feedback at the same time. And I can ensure obviously the actions are closed out. It's a clean, simple, user-friendly inspection process with a central action tracker, which we didn't have before. Uh, before, all the rigs would have their action trackers uh, on the rigs, um, and then you have to phone or send an email saying, can you, you know, send me some information through? Um, can you take a picture, et cetera? And so the tablets are used for um, toolbox talks, active monitoring. Uh, we've also have Check It. Uh, we've got the eDrops inspection apps, and we're developing these e-apps um, as we progress. The good things with doing things online, if it's successful, you need to trial it with the team to make sure that, you know, they actually work as designed, is we don't need to continually change the paperwork. So we're moving more on to electronic and making it more user friendly. So minimum mouse clicks, uh, you can see the icons in the far right, is minimum uh, push of the button, basically. We don't want to go through six, seven applications to get to the one you want. Uh, this is your drops up, which area is it, and this is what you need to inspect. In addition to that, some of our operations have been using helmet cams. So the Derek man goes up, does the inspection, and we can video that all the way through. And then the Derek man, in partnership with, say, the driller or the tool pusher, night tool pusher, will then sit down if they don't have the tablet available and go through the picture book and check it. That's in place, that's in place. So you know, there's lots of ways we can do things to continually improve rather than just use documentation. I know from my rig visits, I used to travel every month. When I do look at um, drops, inspections, et cetera, it's, it's so easy to tick the box, tick the box, and everything's okay. It doesn't really give me the verification. So I do look for photographic evidence a lot of the time. It's simple, it's easy, and the photographs or the media doesn't lie, or the images that you take, you know, you can verify things straight away. Um, so that's been a further area we've introduced. It is still getting developed, um, but it is proven successful. Another area that we've introduced a number of years ago, I'm sure we all have red zone management, is the management of the red zones. It's easy to put a barrier up, but you need to manage the red zone. So a red zone with the layout and activities in the area presents significant risk to personnel being exposed to potential dropped objects under normal circumstances. Uh, for us, the red zones include the drill floor and the catwalk areas. There's various barriers you can use. You can use the water fill barriers, as you can see the image you know, on the left. And on the right-hand side, you can use hard barriers, as you can see in the catwalk. Um, the image on the right-hand side, this is from one of our Middle East um, operations. We also put in an air-conditioned cabin at the back. Because what we found within red zones is it's easy for individuals to step in, move the drill pipe, whatever activity they're doing, 
but they tend not to step out because we're human, we'll always go for the easy option. So you'll sit against the barrier, you'll lean against the barrier and you won't focus. By putting in a go-to place, like an air-conditioned cabin in 40, 50 degree heat, individuals will naturally walk in, carry out the task, and then they're comfortable, they'll go back to their comfortable area, which is the air-conditioned cabin, which is looking up to the catwalk area and they can see the operations. So you don't turn your back to the operations, you don't turn uh, your back to the catwalk or any lifting of, or tailing in a pipe. And um, that's proved very, very successful. In addition to that, we've put gates uh, and entry gates uh, on the stairs to the drill floor and it's authorised personnel only. You know, it's a hard physical barrier. You can put signs up, but the signs, you become sign blind. If you put a, a, a gate up, it's either a sliding gate or a gate on a spring. So if there was an emergency, the gate doesn't impede your, obviously, exit. Um, but signage is there as well put it all around the catwalk and the catwalk remain, you know, the barriers remain around the catwalk and the drill floor for the period of time that's required. Um, in Russia is another area of pushed harder. They've successfully bringing in the hard barriers. They did have a tendency to use barrier tape or hazard tape, the red and white tape. Personally, I don't like the tape. Um, it doesn't really get, it's just a visual. It doesn't give any real protection. And it's so easy to step over the tape or the tape gets broken. And I, I don't know about your own, own operations, but how often do you see around operation hazard tape that's been left? You've got maybe one meter hanging off a, you know, a railing, et cetera, is use it. And we're also considering using the hazard tape under permit to limit the use of hazard tape because it's so easy just to put it all around like confetti. So, but the red zones include the drill floor and catwalk, as I said, we've got the red zone posters up in place. And on the drill floor, we've got our uh, colour-coded zones as well. They work really, really effectively um, if you manage them. You can't just put the barrier up and hope for the best. They need to be managed, and we also have drops wardens in place. And the drops wardens inspect this, and they manage and monitor any lifting operations that could cause a potential drop. Um, so the red zone management, one of them, as you can probably tell, I'm very keen on. Lead lifting person training, we introduced this um, two and a half years ago. Uh, again, sat with the team and looked at industry best practice. I also uh, looked at industry competent lead lifting person uh, or a CLP, competent lifting person, and we developed our own in-house training. Because of a large enough organisation, it made sense to develop to suit us. And lifting and hoisting again, potential drops continue to be one of the major causes of serious or high potential incidents within our industry. It's not just within KCA Doitec. Every lift we do has a risk. It needs to be managed. And if the task is undertaken in a safe, efficient manner, uh, we introduce the, this training. The purpose of the training is to find the way in which all lifting equipment, lifting activities are controlled across our operations. Um, so we developed the training and then we had volunteers that are generally competent and involved in lifting regularly from our country operations coming to um, last year, well, the year before it was Dubai. Uh, it's a five-day course uh, led by a technical expert out with the organisation. So we do three days of theory in line with our worldwide standards and procedures. And then to put that into practice, we then do two days of practical training. So we had a site that we identified um, in the desert, basically, but we do blind lifts, practical lifts, technical lifts, etc. Um, and this is assessed. So there's an examination at the end for the practical side. There's also an examination at the end for the theory. So we've got evidence through knowledge and we've got evidence through understanding by practical application. It's a train the trainer qualification. So all attendees that um, attended the lead lifting course actually go through a vocational qualification as well and to give them the train the trainer qualification. And it covers the 20 key lifting objectives we identified we need to focus on. And we also developed the global competency logbook for lifting operations, which I'll come on to there. Um, as you can see, you know, course content, 20 key areas. We have the golden rules for lifting and we have introduced our global competency logbook, um, which again, our competency system was developed in partnership with the crews. It's simple, it's easy to use, and I'll, I'll come to that uh, shortly. Our lifting operations competency logbook uh, is to assess the way in which lifting equipment, lifting activities are controlled across the, the group and the business unit to our lifting standards. And our method of assessment is observation of the employee during the task. We will ask 
key questions which are contained within the uh, competency logbook. Uh, inspection of the product by the assessor. So it could be show me your lift plan, show me your permit to work, show me your toolbox talk. Um, but you know, show me any videos that have been taken. We tend to take some videos of lifting operations as well. And the logbook records uh, evidence that employee was involved in the task. Um, as I said, we've got 20 knowledge and skills elements. And I also introduced crane and forklift competency assessments. Because what we found within our operations, we have third parties on site a high amount of the time, crane and forklift uh, drivers or operators. And it's easy to come with a license to say I'm competent, but then we assess them. It's an A4 page, double-sided, that the either the tool pusher or the senior supervisor who's competent in lifting will go out and assess the individual. And it's not in just the operation of the equipment, it's in have you done your tests and inspections? Are the alarms functioning correctly? You know, show me, talk to me, you know, as much evidence as we can get to prove that the individuals are competent to operate that equipment. Because we've had incidents involving cranes, uh, crane operators, et cetera, um, because the standard they've been trained to is below the standard we expect. So we've done a lot of work on that and with success again. Simple little things that are easy for the on-site team, especially the supervisors, to go out and assess against. You know, we're not trying to create 20 pages of documentation. It's, okay, I want you to go out. You've got a new crane operator, forklift operator, go and assess them against these competency assessments, both knowledge and skills, and then visually watch what's going on. In addition to that, as I said, we have the drops wardens in place that will assist um, along with HAC and the supervisors in site. And uh, the statement, you see the little footsteps here, confidence in their competence. It's not one big step that does it. There's lots of small steps. You know, we're continually looking at how we can improve effectively without introducing more documentation. You know, my concept is if we introduce one thing, we should be taking one thing away because it's impossible as humans to remember everything, but it has to be practical. It has to work on the rig side. And the final one uh, we've recently introduced are the four C's for supervisors. Uh, what I've found is when supervisors are out on the rig sites or the team are out on the rig site and we're doing e electronic active monitoring or active monitoring, you know, using the documentation, is what are we actually looking at? So when you go out to your rig sites or work sites and you look, is what are you actually, if I was to ask, what are you looking at? What are you looking for? The general answer is I'm just checking the procedures I've been adhered to. I'm just checking the standard. I'm just checking they're working safely. Mm, yeah, they're generic answers. They don't really give me much substance. So in partnership with the team, uh, we reviewed previous incidents and trends, and we identified areas requiring improvement. And a lot of it is down to behaviours and individuals. You know, as humans, we will make mistakes, but how do we stop the mistakes? And that's through situational awareness is step back, look up, look down, look around and make sure the area is safe. And to continually improve, we identified the four C's. And this is based on around um, health, successful health and safety management. There is documentation to substantiate this. So when you're stepping back and you're watching a lifting operation, forklift operation, or someone's doing a drops inspection, or you know anything with the risk is, have you assessed the communications? Spoken, written communication, clear, confirmed, and understand. Is the appropriate time taken to deliver the message? Questions asked for two-way dialogue, observed, etc. So communications, it can apply to pre-shift brief. It can apply to a drops inspection. It can apply to a lifting operation. The communications need to work. It's so easy for everybody to go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pre-shift brief, crew safety meetings. You need to engage and inspire. So people can't just sit there and the crew go, yeah, 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 yeah. Do you understand? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What confirmation have I got? Controls. So when you're, you know, monitoring what's going on in regards to lifting and drops, et cetera, is the trick to the right standard? Is the job safety analysis to the right level? The task, task risk assessment? Has a planned time out for safety being taken? Is a permit to work in place? Is, does the lift plan actually cover the lift and the hazards? Are barriers in place and have they been verified? Is the red zone managed? Is appropriate PPE worn? You know, hard hats, gloves, et cetera, whatever the task is. And the equipment to be used is confirmed and operated as designed. You know, you've not bypassed the alarm system on the crane. You know, I've experienced that on numerous occasions. 
And then working with third parties or working with different parties on site, cooperation, we all need to work together, all involved, including the client and third party, understand the task and agree to comply with the required safety controls. And that ties nicely into the controls and communication above. And then looking at competence, um, are individuals involved, do they have the relevant skills and knowledge, experience and the correct attitude? Attitude comes into play as well because you might get someone having a bad day and you need to manage that. You can't accept that because he may make a mistake that affects everyone else. So it all ties in, you know, to any task that we're carrying out. And as I said, we, we're using this for active monitoring to continually improve, focusing on the four Cs, but this applies just as much to lifting operations, just applies just as much to drops, doing the inspections, et cetera. Even if it's an, it's an inspection, whoever's been assigned the inspection, you know, has he got the logbook? Does he have the tablet? Does he know how to use it? You know, does everybody know he's a way to do, or she's a way to do a drops inspection? So communications, they may need to stop the operation. So it's cooperation involved there. Is the individual, does he have the experience to carry out the inspection? So competence. But by applying the above in our daily routines, we can continually improve the level of supervision in every task. It's teamwork, improve our safety performance. And when I say supervision, supervision we all supervise no matter what level. A roustabout, he'll be, you know, he'll be carrying a task, but he's supervising his work area to make sure it's safe for himself and others around him to push our overall accountable responsible for the rig, but we all supervise. So again, this interactive media developed um, with Rouser. It's interactive, there's pause points in place, and the prompts you see there is we've added these prompts on the four Cs to our active monitoring. So when anyone's out doing any active monitoring that, and we record that, they focus on these four Cs and we've had added prompts for them. I did look at communications and I saw X, Y, and Z. So it's not tick a box, it's put in a brief comment, take a picture. So we try and make it as user-friendly as physically possible. Um, there we go. And the final slide, as you can see within our organization, we focus on managing drops and lifting. As an integral part of HSA systems, you must you know, focus on lifting and drops. And these are, we are seeing marked improvements through our rig operations. There's numerous ways we can manage drops hazards in the workplace. And there isn't one single way that will be successful. You have to try numerous initiatives and numerous uh, processes to continually improve. And as you can see, you know, we're continually improving. We're not quite at zero yet. A lot of our rig operations are, um, but it's a continuous process. Learn from the incidents, communicate effectively, uh, and share the learning as I'm doing today. As I said, it's just to give you an example of what we're doing within KCA Doitoig. It's an ongoing focus that we must manage. And I think we all want to achieve the same in all our operations is our drive to zero, zero incidents, zero accidents. Okay, so thank you very much for your time and giving me the opportunity to present. Thank you very much, uh, Kenny. Uh, that was uh, certainly a very interesting uh, presentation. And I think, uh, so there's a lot of uh, discussion going on in the, um, in the chat box. Um, a lot of people commenting, agreeing with you, asking questions. And about the questions, I would like to ask, if you'd like them answered, please use the Q&A um, uh, button because it's, it's really hard for us to scroll through all the chat and, and, and pick up the, the questions. So please post them there and it will be uh, easier for William uh, to address them and, and answer uh, together with Kellen, uh, Kenny and uh, Alan. Um, the videos that Kenny uh, showed, uh, some of them are available on our uh, YouTube channel. We just posted them uh, uh, this morning. Uh, I will post the link in, in the chat uh, shortly as well. So um, after the Q&A session, we'll be transitioning to our virtual networking reception. Uh, this will be outside uh, Zoom. Um, and if you've not already done so, please navigate to dropsvr.org slash apps and download one of these um, apps. If you're on a personal uh, PC, um, I recommend you use the Windows uh, app. But if you're like on a corporate uh, PC, you're not able to install uh, apps, then, then use the uh, Android or iOS app. 
Um, so after installing, uh, you may log in uh, using your uh, iOS account, um, a Google account or LinkedIn account. Um, and then you'll be able to navigate uh, the virtual uh, environment with, with an avatar. And then you kind of walk up to another table um, and you can talk to, to other people. It's as easy as that. Uh, no, honestly, it's, it's, it's not super simple. Uh, it is. Um, it takes a little bit more effort than perhaps uh, Zoom, but it's really uh, quite an engaging way to to communicate with others, and and you know it gives you an opportunity to meet with others. While you've been listening to us, here's an opportunity to meet with others, meet with Kenny, meet with William, meet with Alan, uh, and have a chat with them, and of course meet with the other participants. So um, yeah, collaborate, share, and learn. So um, I'd like to express my thanks to uh, the sponsors uh, once again. Um, so uh, DropSafe um, is, is one of our sponsors. They create solutions to prevent uh, dropped objects falling from height. They're quite well known for their safety nets um, and barricades and, and a few other products uh, and are widely used throughout the oil and gas industry. Uh, Stop Drop Tooling, uh, they provide a complete engineered solution for working at height with tools. Uh, so for land rig operations, they have these dedicated land rigs, but they can also customize this to your to your needs. So Access Group uh, provide a range of inspection services, including drops, as well as digital solutions to manage uh, dropped object prevention. Uh, you will find their presentation on our YouTube site uh, as well. So um, let me just stop sharing for a second. Uh, yeah. Stop share. There we go. Um, so of course you could reach out to uh, to the sponsor via their um, website, and they're on the call as well. Um, but uh, in case uh, you would like them to reach out to you directly, I've just put up a poll. Um, and if you'd like to share your contact details with them, just tick the box uh, next to it, and then uh, I will share your contact details with them, uh, and they will reach out to you. Um, Okay, so now this um, commercial intermission is complete. We'll be moving on to the Q&A session. Um, we'll be broadcasting the audio uh, into our Drops Forum app. Um, so if you don't have any questions, you could move there and just listen to the audio there until that session ends and then join the networking. Uh, but if you do have questions yourself, uh, please stick around uh, here uh, a bit. Um, okay, in the meantime, I see lots of people uh, answering the polls. So just a, just a heads up, um, it will be probably a while before uh, they can answer you because there's a lot of people responding. Um, but in the meantime, you can still answer. And um, then uh, William, uh, the floor is yours. Right, thanks a lot, Joachim. Lots of information, lots of questions coming into the chat and uh, we welcome that. Uh, so, so, but before I pass and ask a few questions to Kenny because there are some questions that's going to Kenny. I'll, I'll just like to pose one question to Alan over here. And if Alan, you can help us here. Uh, just if someone in our audience is really new to Drops and would like to know and run their own campaign over here, you know, maybe you can share with us how they should start. Certainly, yeah. I mean, hopefully uh, everybody picked up on a few points that Kenny made that basically every every task, um, there's a consideration for, for drops. So there's, first thing everybody needs to be assured of is through drops, through the industry initiative, there's lots of support. The best way to access that is to go onto the website. But I realize that's, that can be quite daunting. So what I, what I want to do is just share my screen, if that's okay. Hopefully um, you can see the drops website. Um, of course, I get the opportunity every time to thank all of the supporters of Drops, that's hence all the logos along the bottom, but simply go straight into the resources and guidance part. Um, and within there, you will see those same graphics that you saw in Kenny's um, presentation, a slightly different arrangement, but the top left one, the recommended practice document, I would always urge everybody to go straight there. It's, uh, it's where you should really start. If you, if you want to make this commitment towards drops, you've really got to make this part of your safety management system. So the key elements are all there. Um, you can click on this and it takes you straight to a download and that download will look like this. Now, I would urge you next step, have a look at the contents. So you can actually bring up the contents down the side here. And that gives you an idea of just how many different areas you need to cover. Um, many of those Kenny's already given you a summary of, 
it was all again part of the key, key elements of the of the of a system. Um, but the key parts, if you open this one up here, we've got the um, the very first page of section two point one. This gives you a good idea of what you should find in your management system. And then as you work your way through it, you will find resources within drops that help you establish that. So things like the risk assessment, there's a short uh, description here, but then within the booklet and within the reliable securing, um, within the access to things like the, the drops calculator, all available through the website, you can start to build um, or, or um, integrate drops into your existing risk assessment. Drop zones, safety management system bridging, all that kind of high level stuff, depending on whether you're an operator or a drilling contractor or a third party, it's all there. Drops inspection, again, broken down into a section. And within there, we've got those key elements of, you know, what, what are the, the fundamental requirements, references to the technical content, and then examples of best practice. And as you work your way through that, you will find links to the other drops um, uh, best practice and guidance documents. But again, it's important to think we've got the, you know, the independent drops inspection requirement, we've got the systematic drops inspection requirement, we've got the worksite hazard management, uh, worksite visual inspections. So it doesn't matter where you work, even down to transportation and, and uh, uh, of equipment and loads, there's still an element of drops inspections there. So you start to realize just how broad this subject can be. Um, and then, of course, the hazard management section. And here you have all of the components that you need. I'm not going to go through all of them here, but things like reliable securing, good reference book there that links to a PDF download. Um, how does this translate or, or how does this uh, compare to what others are doing? Um, well, again, Kenny mentioned the KCA system or the KCA, um, uh, the key elements of, of, of their uh, standard. And this to me makes perfect sense. If you think about this in sequence, if we have a clear idea of what we have at height or what we use at height, what we take at height, if we have inventories and log books, then we can address those engineered controls. This is assuming, of course, or presuming, that we've got rid of the things that we don't need. So the engineered controls get a good focus here. And then throughout the next steps, things like maintenance and other activities, where um, particularly we hand over between different groups, it's highlighted again that it's an important part of the process is to consider those key elements of, of engineered controls, to be able to survey and inspection them, uh, in, inspect them. And then the clear distinction between what we call the reliable securing components, you know, the, the primary fixings and secondary retention components, and the safety securing devices, those things that we've installed in response to the risk. Zones, tools, that hide, all of these all broken down into, into, into neat chunks that all linked to um, well, training support as well as the actual physical hardware. So everybody's following this same model. We do it in slightly different ways. But the one thing I would draw your attention to is once we put this stuff in place, we always have to think that many of our tasks involve the reverse cycle. Again, highlighting things like maintenance. We, we take the time to install things. We put things in place. We check, we inspect. To ensure they're all in place. Are we, or do we verify that we're doing that after every task, after intrusive maintenance? You know, that's when we take everything, is we, we, we do that whole reverse cycle of reliable security. So again, take the time to, to look at the content, the structure of this document, and then you can start to realize how important it is to think beyond just that survey and inspection. There's much, much more. We're always here to help Admin at Drops Online, you know, it's a free resource that's funded by the industry. If we can help in any way, just give us a shout. Thanks, William. Thanks, Alan. Thank you so much. Very informative. Well, with that, I think uh, we have lots of questions and I'm going through the list over here and, and I'll definitely pick up a few questions. And Kenny, maybe the first question going to you. And this is from a different industry, okay? So, so Bila says he is from construction industry and HSC manager. He's asking whether the drop object app will be helpful for the construction as well. It definitely would. The drop object, no matter what your industry, especially in construction, having lived in the Middle East for 10 years, you, they, they, they do have a serious problem. And, you know, you just need one dropped object and a fatality and you can see the loss, you know, human loss, etc. And, you, you know, no one wants that. 
And it applies directly to any construction site, anywhere where you're working at height and you could potentially drop an object. And a construction site is a, you know, a high risk area uh, with, I'm sure, lots of dropped object or potential dropped objects. So, you know, secondary retention for any of the guys that are putting up the scaffolding, et cetera, it depends on the level of the scaffolders, obviously. And uh, when you're working at height, putting the net in, the kickboards on the scaffold is another example. I've seen crane operations, you know, you've got the fixed gantry cranes, many different types of cranes, high rise. Uh, are they inspected? I doubt it very much. And you look at the competency of the individuals as well. But you could introduce a, a soft approach so you continually improve. You know, Alan's just mentioned there's a huge raft of information there from drops. And it might be daunting, scary when you look at it, think, how can you manage it? But once it's in place, and once people are aware, and once it's embedded and, you know, the team understand, it becomes second nature. We think of drops all the time. We don't walk by and ignore things. So um, definitely applies to that industry as well. And if it's not in place, you could introduce a softer approach, but to start to improve on your performance and obviously remove potential drops. Sure. Thanks a lot, Kenny. Very helpful. Still on the drops apps, okay? And this could be, uh, this is a question for Lawa and he's asking, hey, regarding the drop app, well, will it work if it's at some places that is uh, offline because at some places may not have an uh, internet connection? Yes. The drops app will work offline and basically when you take the tablet out in the rig site, it's offline. And then when you plug it back into this the system, it then connects and it continually updates on a 24 hour basis. So. You know, it's developed so it's portable. So we have had <laughs> we've had a lot of issues with the tablets because if you go to an operation Siberia minus 40, minus 50, you go to Middle East, it's plus 40, plus 50. And the supplier said, yep, yeah, they're working all the temperatures. Well, we found that's not quite correct. Um, but they will work offline because connectivity on the land rigs uh, it's not great. You know, we do work in very isolated areas. But yeah, it's a great question. It does work offline and then it will resync as soon as it's plugged into the network. Thank you so much. Hope that answers your question, Slava. I have another one that is regarding rate zone. This is from Rustam. And he's asking, you know, regarding crane operation area, is that can be recognized as rate zone or is it only the rig floor or, or the catwalk you recognize okay. it as a rate zone? If we were carrying out a heavy lift, a complicated technical lift, we would generally barrier that area off and class it as a red zone. And it stops people walking in, stops people walking out. Because what we that's the time we would use the barrier tape that I detest immensely. Um, because it's impossible to have, you know, 40 hard barriers that you can place around because we move the rigs on a regular basis. But yeah, we would barrier the area off. Uh, we would have the drops warden to manage that. And obviously the supervisor to be on site as well, but we would classify that as a red zone because it is a potential drop. And we have had incidents. We had a lever crane in one of our operations a number of years ago, only lifting 40 kilograms, but it didn't put the outriggers. It wasn't stable and they managed to put it on its side. That is why you have the red zones. Keep people out, make sure it's, and that's what I'm saying is, it's easy to put a barrier up it has to be managed. The most important part, it has to be managed. And why start it up? Put a sign up. Red zone, because crane operations in the day. Simple things like that in the local language. And then it prevents third party operators, truck drivers, forklift drivers, whoever's coming on site, just walking under the barrier because I need to go to the canteen or, you know, I need to go to the toilet, etc. Is manage that red zone. But yes, depending on the lift. I'm with you I'm on the side of caution as well. Now, now, I have one question about drone technology. Maybe I'll, I'll pass this one to Alan and Alan, if you can help us with this. And it's regarding using drone technology for drops inspection, and especially when it comes to direct inspection. Um, what do you think about it? What is your opinion about using drone technology? I'm all one for um, exploring and exploiting new technologies. Um, it, we've been involved in some very interesting um, uh, forums, uh, particularly from the production side, on how best to manage drones. So I think that the technology is interesting, the, particularly the stuff that I'm sure um, Joachim can, can put us in touch with some of the guys that have presented previously that 
you know, in, in conjunction with things like tablets and uh, in conjunction with some of the, um, you know, the uh, interactive elements um, that, uh, that Kenny highlighted. The, the, the software is there, you know, the hardware is there, but I think we have issues with how we actually manage that on site. Um, so in my experience, it's, it's been great. The focus has been on the drop, on, on the potential for a drone to drop or a drone to collide. Um, but there's also that whole principle of all the materials and, and content that goes along with it. Um, when it comes to uh, the physical management, I would always urge you know, everybody to, to consider the fact that there are already systematic controls in place that manage anything that flies in or around you know, um, a, a, you know, a classified installation or anywhere where we always already have those kind of uh, key zones in place. Um, the, you know, there will be corporate documentation that will help you determine whether or not drones are, are suitable. But the technology, and Joe, I'm pretty sure you'll, you'll uh, confirm the technology is, is fantastic, particularly the artificial intelligence side of it. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, that the artificial intelligence sounds very uh, interesting where that is going. And, and I definitely like to see if we can organize a webinar just talking about that that topic. And uh, we can talk about that quite a while. And, and there's some really great, great developments going on. But uh, back to you, William. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I have another question, and, and this is definitely this is definitely a, a question uh, coming out from the presentation Kenny did just now. So Isaac asks, you know, what are the challenges in ensuring the assurance or effectiveness of those initiatives that uh, you guys have put in place? I think the assurance is the verification. You know, when we develop any of our initiatives, it's not someone sat behind the desk. We develop it with the rig site teams. We'll come up with a concept. There'll be a number of country operations involved as well. So, you know, if you look to Oman, huge, you know, we've got a large rig operation there, 18 plus rigs, Russia, 16 plus rigs, but we take everybody into account. So we develop it. I'll come up with a concept. We'll have a small working group and then we'll trial things first on rig sites to get the feedback. Does this actually work? Does this improve or does this, you know, cause of frustration basically. So it's making sure the end user sees the benefit for the improvement on our drive to zero. You know, it's not, I've looked at so many different organizations and you know, oh, we've got this e-learn and we can do this for you, you can do that for you. Yeah, that's systems, but we're people. You know, you have to think of the human and I'm very much mindset of, does the end user on the rig site understand what we're trying to do? Does the roustabout that's sitting in the middle of the desert or middle of Siberia or in Iraq and Kurdistan in the mountains where it's you know cold in the winter and warm in the summer, does he really understand what we need to do here? So it's keeping it simple but making it effective. And I, I look at my role as to take out all the, the technical part and take out all the legislative parts. So when it gets to the rig site, the guys pick it up and think, oh, I get that, I understand that. That's not going to be difficult. I can do that without adding to their day. You know, it's like if you speak to a tool pusher, generally, tool pushers are fantastic. You know, they run the rig, but they always complain about the paperwork. But if you have a competent crew and you had a perfect crew, and these equations I asked them, I said, well, you've got, a, if you had a really 100% competent crew, you wouldn't be so busy. So, but it's your role and, you know, to make sure everybody's competent. And it's just encouraging it both ways from bottom up and top down, you know, to have a team environment. But I think you have to trial and test it to make sure that it meets the needs of the organisation. But at the same time, it's, it's practicable on the rig site. Because I've seen so many organisations try and introduce things that won't work. Or we have a competency online system. Yeah, if you've got connectivity. If you can't get online, what's the point? You can't, and not everybody's got a log on account. And at the end of shift, you do you really want to log on and put in your portfolio? No, let's make it easier. Our competency system, all our supervisors are trained as assessors. But if I asked as an example is, give me a definition of competence. I'm sure everybody in the call, I'd probably get X amount of different answers. So we've got a competency assessor DVD, a competency DVD that explains competency, someone who's got the skills, experience, attitude, and knowledge, that's competence. And then we have a supervisor's a DVD for assessment in the workplace, which is interactive. And then we, for others, we have verifiers in place. You know, it's, it's a stepping stone process to make sure things work. But no, it's, it's a really good question. And 
I'm not saying ours is perfect, but you have to listen to the teams. Absolutely. Yeah. Engage, engaging people, you know, and then seek <laughs> solutions, right? So, so that's good. And and with that, with that answer that you have provided, and probably this question is for you know uh, Alan and or Kim as well. And you probably heard it before. This is from Dave Taylor, and he asks Shell and, and typically in the UK had a great program. It's called Let's Leave Less, right? So, well, if you don't leave it, you can't drop it. So, uh, maybe if if a, if maybe let's begin with a Alan first, if you can help. What do you what have you been seeing the industry doing with that thought process uh, with this program? Um. I have experience of, of that, and it's one of those things that, um, you know, it's, it's a fantastic concept to think, well, if, if we can get back to the start and actually think about changing the way that we work and understanding every element that affects how we work, the understanding of, you know, is what we do, um, you know, does that actually reflect what we expect should be done? And coming up with those simple solutions, which is great, but then if you think about how the humans then perform with that new role, um, the other pressures, which we forget about, are um, the pressures that would help um, you know, remove the requirement for lifting. We now bring in other pressures, whether it be financial or, or changing the, the, the way in which we do the task, which results in more lifting. Um, I mean, one of the examples being like a, an environmental performance uh, requirement to reduce the amount of, say, mud being transferred to um, by, by vessel and the exposure to general public, et cetera, et cetera, is to treat as much as we can on board, results in more lifting. So it's, it's like a, an interesting concept, but it, it's one of those things that's highlighted the fact that to do that, you need, you need to take the, take the business apart and start to understand that when you do make these kind of changes, as, as simple and as smart as they may, may seem, that you know, other changes probably need to be made too. Um, but the key principle, in the hierarchy of control, and it's a key principle of drops is, if we don't need to do it, don't do it. We don't need to take it up there. We don't need to go up there. It's that same principles of work at height. If we can eliminate what we do and start thinking about different ways of working, then we can start to, uh, to really, uh, well, really appreciate what we have when it comes to engineer controls. Um, so yeah, I think it's a great program. I wish I'd seen more of it. Thanks, Alan. Hey. I'm caution of the time, and and probably, and uh, I, I think we have to wrap it up from the la with the last question over here, and and this is a question uh, if Joachim can help us, you know, with this. So Paul Kara asks, is the jobs picture book digital, and and uh, if yes, uh, what is the device to be used uh, on jobs picture book? Okay, so so the, kind of the, the if you're referring to the picture book that you're kind of using to do internal uh, inspections, um, yeah, I mean it was originally designed as a kind of a word document, and then that's printed, and then people use it as a paper booklet. But most people uh, use digital solutions for that, uh, you know, and and they're in various stages of digitalization, right? Some people simply take that book, they, that hard copy, and put it on their tablets. And some companies do uh, have it completely integrated into their management system. And we kind of saw that in our last webinar when, when Access uh, presented that. And, and, you know, but there's other companies that have also developed this, this kind of in-house. So this is kind of, yeah, uh, transitioning. But I, I would say, yeah, if you're still using uh, a paper copy uh, and carrying that up, um, yeah, it's, it's time to upgrade to something uh, digital. Hearing that from the Mr. Digital over here, drop him. <laughs> right. Hey, we really want to answer all the questions over here. Unfortunately, you know, we just uh, do not have uh, the time uh, allowing us to do that. Um, but, but please continue to, to feel free to chat and, and we all will be happy to continue to have the conversation and all this conversation is going to be helpful for us going forward uh, as an industry and as a drops community. Exactly. Um, with that, uh, I pass it back to you, Joachim. Yeah. 
Yeah, thanks. So yeah, I, I see the questions are, are, are coming in faster than, than we can answer them. So it's, uh, yeah, we, we, can't, uh, we can't keep on going, but what I'll suggest is um, we, we have a copy of all the questions. We'll review that and I'll, I'll reach out to you, Kenny and, and Alan, and see whether we can answer some of these questions uh, offline. And then we'll add them to the uh, minutes of the meetings, which will then be distributed um, th through our uh, newsletter. And if you've attended this event um, and registered, then, then you should be receiving that uh, as well. And you can look out for it on, on our social media uh, channels as well. Um, yeah, so with that, um, I, you know, I'd like to invite you to, to join us in the, in the virtual networking reception. And um, well, um, look, looking forward to chat with you there. Um, before we go, um, Kenny, would you say, like to say any last words? No, just thank you for all the questions. Um, I will try and answer, you know, when we can, once we get them all together. Um, and as I said, it's, it's just trying different methods and different processes in line with industry best practice. You know what will fit your organisation. But sometimes they have to be a little bit different. If you do the same, you get the same. So sometimes we, always, we all need to do something different to continually improve. But no, thanks for dialing in and I hope everybody enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, stay safe. Excellent, excellent, and Alan as well. Uh, so, so Alan, you know, sp spent some time asking, answering some excellent questions. Um, he does a, a train the trainer uh, course online, uh, which you'll find on the same website as as he presented, and that's kind of a really good one day kind of in-depth depth immersion into into everything uh, dropped object prevention. So, um, you know, if you're if you're overloaded and you're kind of new starting, you know, that's a good good place to start to learn all about um, uh, drops and you can reach out to, to Alan uh, for that. Uh, and Alan, any, any last words? Uh, no, just please explore the website. Um, a couple of things that I should have said um, you know, was that uh, within that um, recommended practice document, there are links to a gap assessment or a gap analysis. And just and again, an Excel file, which again is another way of kind of promoting what what Kenny has been saying is that you take the time to really think how each of those elements is 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 landing at the work site, uh, and and how you know how everybody's managing to work with it. Um, when it comes to cone of exposure, I would ex uh, the the, uh, the the principles of, of considerations behind deflections. Remember the new calculator. So go to the website, go to drops calculator, and you will see a new um, deflection or or zone calculator. Again, it's not recommending that that's what you use to determine where your barriers go. Our recommendation is, is so that you can all start to realize that um, you know, gravity is a hazard. We need to understand it. And when it comes to deflections, there's a science behind that too, that we should be refocusing our minds on elimination, substitution, and good controls at the work site. So thanks, everybody. We're always here to help. All right. So we had the virtual networking reception. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Owen.